Hello, this is uh, Chris Elton of the Dorkland blog and um, bringing you a special um, Dorkland roundtable for the uh, concurrent online con. With me today, tonight, are Jason Durall, best known for um, his work on the basic role-playing Big Gold Book for Chaosium. And joining him is Ben Monroe, best known for writing a bunch of scary zombie stuff. That's right. Um, today we're going to talk about um, uh, just all sorts of fun stuff, and, and uh, we'll talk about uh, basic role-playing, and we'll get to um, the launch of the new Magic World game for basic role-playing. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, <clears throat> too many interviews in a row. Um, Let's start. My standard starting point for, for these things is to fire up the Wayback Machine and um, have you guys talk about uh, how you got started as a gamer, what your, your first game was, and, and uh, roughly about uh, when you did it. So why don't we have uh, you start, Ben, since you're, you're on, my, on my left. Uh, okay. I guess so, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> when I was about three, um, and after that, I got into... Uh, uh, geez, I it was one of the D&D early box sets, uh, circa 79-80. Um, it was the one that had the the red cover and the dragon and the guys kind of poking into the dungeon. Oh, not the red cover, the, the blue cover, I'm sorry. Right. Um, with the red dragon on it. Uh, from there to AD&D, uh, shortly after that to RuneQuest, uh, and then Call of Cthulhu, and then just you know, a little bit of everything. It was downhill from there. And uh, and you, j <coughs> excuse me. And you, Jason. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I started with uh, I think my mother got me a copy of the uh, D and D from like 1978 out of the Sears Roebuck catalog when they had those, and then it was right from that to uh, RuneQuest, Dragon Quest, then straight into the Chaosium uh, line of games: Call of Cthulhu, Stormbringer. Um, and so on. ElfQuest, Ringworld, Superworld, as they came out. Um, so what was it about the, the, the Chaosium stuff that, that held your attention longer than the, the you know, the, the more mainstream D&D stuff that you started with? Ben? Uh, you know, for me, it was that the, uh, you know, the RuneQuest and, and games like that, they they felt like the stories I was reading at the time. You know, I play D and D. Why can't my wizard have a sword? Gandalf has a sword. You know, can't my my hobbit wear chainmail? You know, it doesn't work that way in that game. But in RuneQuest, you can just do whatever you wanted to do. You want to learn how to you know, use a sword? You get a sword. And you whack a guy over the head with it, and you start you know learning how to use it. Um, and actually, to be honest, uh, Troll Pack was the first exposure to RuneQuest. Um, I got that and just thought the idea oh. of okay. Uh, you know, the idea of, of cultures being so important to the game, you know, not just what your stats are. This is my son, Aiden, and he's just showing us a dungeon map that he just drew. And now he's going to go to the other room. Yeah, it has Bye. a ninja for the character. There you go. But you can play ninja. You can play ninja. Apparently, play a ninja. Okay, thank you. Have fun. Um, yeah, these, these kids today. I know, with their maps and their dungeons and their crazy pants. So, Jason, I lost my train of thought. How about you? Yeah. Um, uh, the stuff that, the reason the, the BRP line of games, the Chaosium games, really appealed to me, um, there, were, there were really two reasons. The first was that um, I liked the fact that all of those games were really tied to, uh, like, literary properties that I knew and loved. You know, I mean, I, I had read the Elric books before I started playing Stormbringer. I was a H.P. Lovecraft fan before I started playing Call of Cthulhu. Whereas with D&D, it was, you know, just create your own stuff. And the other thing um, that I liked was uh, that it was very easy to, uh, like, make up rules on the fly and add my own content to uh, BRP-based games. You know, like I took Stormbringer, and in no time I was running it, you know, with my own world. 
and because I could add rules and uh, new character types, new races. It, it seemed very easy, whereas D&D &D, um, at the time seemed kind of this weird, convoluted mess of gears and pieces that I didn't quite understand how they all meshed together. Well, Stormbringer is, you know, an interesting game in that it, it, it really kind of brought a lot of different design ideas together. Uh, I mean, it's, to it, so did RuneQuest, but um, I think, you know, this, the, you know, when you, when you have um, the games, the background of the game system with, with such people as, you know, um, uh, Greg Stafford and Ken St. Andre and, you know, a, a diverse and interesting bunch of, of individuals coming together to, to, you know, bang their head over rules, it, you know, you, you get something in, unique and interesting, and I think that's what you got with RuneQuest and with Storm, uh, Stormtrooper. Stormbringer, sorry. <laughs> I had a cross-geek cross, cross geek, uh, moment there for a second. Perfect. And you've, you've got the designers of RuneQuest and Tunnels and Trolls coming together to make a game in the world of, of Michael Moorcock. It's like they took game balance and kicked it in the shins. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember when I saw, because um, one of my... I had my my first um, BRP game was was Call of Cthulhu that I, I came across the the third edition box that in in high school and uh, I didn't get introduced to to Stormbringer until I was in college. One of my my buddies knew I was a big fan of Moorcock and um, he was like, "Well, we had to play Stormbringer." And um, to be honest, he had he had it was either first or second edition. I don't remember. But to be honest, I did not like Stormbringer at first, and it just—I read through it, and I was like, it, it just—it just bugged me, and it, not not system-wise, it just—I I don't know. There were just there were just things about it that it took time, I, I will say, for Stormbringer to to grow on me. So, I, I don't think I really embraced it until about like um, probably about third or fourth edition. Yeah, it's a tough call for a game when you know, you know, if you stick to canon, that the entire world is going to implode in, like, what, four years or something. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, I don't I don't know if it was that part. I, I don't know what it was that bug. I don't really remember now in hindsight what it was that bugged me about that that first exposure to, to Stormbringer so much, but I did like the Hawkmoon game. That was a lot of fun, but, you know. Um, now, for you guys, what um, what among the, the, the BRP stuff were, has always been the standouts for you? Uh, Stormbringer First Edition for me is still my just my absolute favorite. Um, I, I'm really fond of Pendragon, which is kind of a BRP derivative. Um, and, you know, um, I really dug ElfQuest. I actually thought it was really a neat little game. I mean... Well executed, it worked well, um, and uh, for all of its uh, kind of warts, I think that the old Worlds of World of Wonders box set, um, or Worlds of Wonder box set with Magic World, Super World, and uh, Future, Future World, World. Yeah. You know, that was just incredibly cool. Like the notion of hey, here's I, I'd never seen anything like that before, and so it still to me strikes me as being kind of revolutionary, and that you've got a core. You know, a core rule set, and then three different worlds it comes with, and they're all more or less interchangeable. Like you can slot content in and out of either one. And they had that cool map that that actually allowed you to physically go from one world to the other, which was never, which was a really neat thing. I've never seen that map. I've only gotten the books individually. Uh, <laughs> I, I I came across my copy of uh, the copy I have of that at at a con somewhere, and I think I bought it for like ten, fifteen bucks. I mean, it wasn't. It's not in. It you know. It's not in like mint shape or anything. But you know, it it was just neat. And that I was. I remember opening up and looking at that map and going, "What a weird yet very cool idea." The fact that you know, Super World and and Magic World and and Future World were not only worlds, but they had another world. That you could wander around and had doorways to all of these different worlds. So one of the charming things with, with Worlds of Wonder as well was the fact that you had, you know, the I've got my stack of crap over here. So here's the uh, the reprint of the, the 
current edition of basic role playing, the, the mini book, which I'm sure you all know well. But this is the same thing as it was, you know, 30 years ago when this thing came out. It's about 16 pages long, 16 pages. Yeah. And then you've got another 16 pages for Future World, 16 for Magic World, and effectively you've got a little, you know, get going RPG in 32 pages. I would love to see something like that come back. I mean, yeah. the idea of something where start with this and make it up from there. You know, it's, it's so easy to be RPG. Yeah, there are some other companies doing that, but they, you know, they're not as big, I guess. It seems, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's that's at, sort of at the heart of a lot of, like, the old school movement is getting back to those, you know, the simpler games and the, you know, having, having a, a complete game in, like, 80 pages as opposed to, you know, 200 and... Right. Well, I think that's a, an exciting thing that... The old school crowd with the indie games is it's gone back to really embrace the, the DIY, the do-it-yourself mentality. It's like I have an idea, I'm going to do it. I mean, yeah. you know, when Greg started doing this stuff, he was he talks about Worms Footnotes, um, pushing these things out on his old Ditto machine. You know, and he stepped by hand and he made a game. You know, now we have Lulu to do all the heavy lifting for you, but there's still got to be someone there to, you know, put the words down and draw a picture, or find it online or something, and people are just doing it themselves, which is awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's just this huge community of people that are, you know, just tearing things apart and rebuilding them into into new and sometimes scary in a in a good way, um, you know, games. So, um, you know, in a way that that kind of um, does with with the more. The more recent version of of uh, RuneQuest that was done by Mongoose, kind of opening the 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 genie in the bottle uh, with having a lot of the, the 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 mechanics that are used for for BRP and opening them them up to everyone. How how does that make it harder for you know selling like say a new fantasy game that that's using BRP that, you know, that Chaos Team is doing, like, say, Magic World. <laughs> As an example. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I'm currently actually running an Open Quest game. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's... Uh, I'm, I'm one of the Open Quest 2 backers. Well, you know I'm, I'm familiar with Open Quest, because I did the review. For those of you on the Internet who aren't familiar with Open Quest, it's sort of a <laughs> rewind down version of, of Mongoose's Room Quest. Um, I think it's excellent. You know, I'm, I'm, with I'm, an old school sensibility. I'm sorry. With an old school sensibility. Yeah, well, new. I, I, I kind of became a friend of, of the developer um, just because I liked the game so much. I started talking to him, and we've become friends now. Um, and he really did embrace that sort of old school. He wanted to make you know a version of RuneQuest that was a lot like the original Chaosium RuneQuest. You know, mm. Louise Prin covered. It just it got to work and it did what it did. Yeah. Um, I love what Laws and Pete have done in RQ6. Uh, I've been reading the PDF. I haven't uh, gotten the hard copy yet, but I'm really enjoying what I saw them do there. Um, and obviously, Magic World is coming along uh, shortly. Hopefully, maybe by the end of this year is my guess, if not, if not sooner. Um, and what you really do, what you do see here, is you've got a fantasy version of BRP that's gone in three different directions. They're all cross-compatible. You can take a monster from one and use it in another uh, with minimal tweaking. Obviously, open quests in RQ are, are a lot easier than, than it would be to cross them with BRP, but even that's not hard. Um, and each of us sort of took our own focus on what we thought was important or interesting to us, You know, what was going to be the neat thing in the game. Um, I love uh, Laws and Feet did the, uh, the new special effects system in the combat rules where you can get a good roll and throw a handful of dust in your opponent's eyes, or uh, trip them, or knock them down. You know, and, and for me, what was most important was streamlining things, and making stuff go a little bit faster. Um, and I would love to hear someday that somebody picked up a copy of Magic World and bolted on those combat special effects and is just having a great time around their table. But do you think that um, that, that makes, that the existence of all of these things makes it harder or easier for these individual games. I mean, you know, you've got you've got RuneQuest, you've got I mean, in in a way 
what what you're doing with with Magic World is is almost doing like an authorized retro clone. Yeah, that's actually a great way to look at it. Um, Magic World is at its core uh, Elric or Stormbringer Five, um, with fiddling and tweaks and, and things that I added into it. Uh, what I think is great about having, you know, I'm, I'm just going to continue with this, these three, you know, Open Quest, RQ6, and, and VR uh, Magical, rather, uh, is that they can each appeal to a specific style of what somebody wants out of the game. I feel that Magic World is a little bit more cinematic and epic, if you will. I mean, it, it was Stormbringer, so it, it tends to deal with high level uh, sort of at its core. Um, whereas RuneQuest and Open Quest, to me, feel a little more gritty. And just you know, figure out which one you like and buy that one, and then whatever else you do, buy the supplements to Magic World. <laughs> yeah. So, so what do you think, Jason? I actually think it makes it easier um, in that all of these games sort of evangelize to the audience. Um, game players and GMs are we we love to buy new material. I mean, there's you know, it's a hobby that people seem to be enjoying investing in and. Like the notion that there are all these different publishers publishing work that's mostly compatible, I think I think people get excited about seeing stuff, knowing, you know, they're looking at uh, Open Quest and they may see a uh, Rune Quest six on a shelf and go, hey, you know, I could buy this and, like Ben says, kit bash some of it together and add to it, or I could take, uh, you know, Magic World and add some stuff from. Uh, you know, one of these other games, like a big gold book, and use that as my base, and do, you know, like purchase the other thing. So I actually think that having a, a stable of publishers, um, all of whom are publishing roughly uh, interchangeable systems, or systems that are easily adaptable to one another, I think it helps everyone, uh, ultimately. It builds enthusiasm for the, uh, the mechanic, it, um, it builds enthusiasm for other products, you know, um, I think it's a, just all a good thing. It makes developers, I mean, everybody that I know of that seems to be writing uh, BRP-based stuff or personal-based stuff, all of them seem to be pretty friendly with one another. At least online, we're all civil. People are, you know, yeah. around. And I noticed that, uh, I mean, I've seen other system stuff where there's a little bit more friction going on between lines. Um, you know, battle lines. That's not to say there might not be some, but uh, for the most part, I see a lot of uh, uh, camaraderie, both on the developer side and the, the fan side. And it, like I said, I think it helps everybody. Now, do you think maybe this this sort of mindset comes from the fact that there's always been a lot of different flavors of BRP, and you know, it it there's always sort of been that hey, let's take the um, you know the weird space creatures from from Ring World and and slam them into a, a Rune Quest game, or I mean, is, so I mean, do you think that just the approach that that Chaos Image has used over the years has sort of fostered that that sort of mindset? Yeah, I think so from the get go. I mean, if you look back at old, you know, some of the oldest stuff like uh, all the world's monsters or uh, the Worms footnote stuff that they were publishing back in the late 70s where they'd have stats for alien xenomorphs for RuneQuest, you know, I mean it was pretty clear that they were expecting people to just be able to pull stuff from anywhere and uh, even though, you know, the different game lines didn't try that hard to, uh, you know, like make things compatible I mean, I would I would not want to try to make RimWorld play well together with uh, early Stormbringer, for example, but um <laughs> But for the most part, I mean, you could do it if you felt like, you know, just fudging some stuff. And I think that they were uh, they were very cool about that. They encouraged that with products like uh, the um, Quest Worlds and Worlds of Wonder. And uh, the other thing that uh, just struck me is they never really did a, a one true way call, you know. I mean, like... Uh, you know, D and D is pretty much the the flagship of the industry, and as you know, it's gone through phases where there have been big, uh, like this is the true way to play D and D. If you're not playing it by the book in this way, you're you're not playing the game correctly. You know, they and I think that that sort of uh, like BRP never did that. There was never any like one flavor that was 
superior or better or mainstream to the others. I mean, Call of Cthulhu has always been the most popular, but um, although I think, well, RuneQuest might have been way back in the day, but there was never a sense of like, you know, this is the official version of the game and this is not. And even now, I mean, with Chaosium, um, I'm noticing a lot of the stuff that's coming out that's either uh, published by Chaosium or is licensed for Chaosium for use with uh, basic role-playing. You know, people are playing fast and loose with the rules, and that's cool. Well, I mean, even if you look back uh, even into the, the late 80s or so, which was you know, pretty much a, a high point for Chaosium when they had I mean, so many games out, you have Rx, Stormbringer, and RuneQuest 3. I mean, that's that's three games, essentially, if you want to say so, doing the same thing. They're all three BRP-based fantasy games. Everyone's different. You know, RuneQuest is not the same level as Stormbringer. Uh, a lot of stuff crossed over back in the... And, uh, I'm sorry, ElfQuest. You know, ElfQuest had strike ranks, had hit locations. Um, Stormbringer had major, uh, sorry, major wounds and the crazy uh, you know, rules for creating demon armor and, and all that awesome stuff. Yeah. Uh, but really, what... Uh, I'm sorry. You know, remember when they took the Call of Cthulhu sanity system and threw it into Stormbringer? In yeah, it was some sort of the demon magic book. And your demon magic or something. Yeah. We I actually had a great. I say I love those those uh, those weird ass uh, demon armor and weapon and stuff rules from from Stormbringer. Um, but yeah, I was say, we actually we had a great game with Sandy one time where he told us all, uh, show up for game night, and bring your favorite character. Whatever, whatever game you want, bring your favorite character. And so I played a Call of Cthulhu guy on the Ring World, you know, with a Stormbringer guy over here, and it was like an Elf Quest elf. And, and he actually, whatever we were doing, he just used the rules for that game to determine what was that happened to us. <laughs> so I them all at once. And it's the kind of thing only Sandy can do. I mean, he's got some whole, I don't know, giant computer brain up there and sending <laughs> him ideas. But I don't get it. But, but I mean, really, you know, in the end, um, yeah, I, I talked to Lynn about this a long time ago, uh, and one of the things that really I always thought was great about the Chaosian system over, or, or why, it, I, I shouldn't say why it's great and excellent, and best game, but why it appealed to me over something like uh, GURPS or Hero was because Chaosian took a, a core fundamentally simple system, you know, roll a D100, something happens, something doesn't happen. You know, that's, it's, it's pretty binary at its core. And then they flavored it. Let's make it feel Call of Cthulhu-like. Let's make it feel more cocky. And let's make it feel like gritty sword and sorcery. Let's do a Larry Niven ring world space thing. And they took that core and made it, made the game feel like what the source material was, rather than, uh, again, you know, my perspective, in a game like Gerb's Hero, they get the license and they, they force that license to fit the game. And you know, for me, it just it was great. I, I love seeing, you know, what were they going to do next? They got the license for. Calvin and Hobbes, what would they do with it? <laughs> um, I think they should have used Call of Cthulhu, definitely, for uh, a Calvin and Hobbes game. I actually wrote a Calvin and Hobbes RPG, and screaming was one of the main mechanics. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, why don't you tell us a little more about, uh, about what's coming up for Magic World? Uh, okay, so the Magic World core rules are at Chaosium. Um, I've been talking to them off and on recently. Uh, I should point out for those of you who are watching this on YouTube or, or, or sitting in the audience, um, I'm not a Chaosium employee. I worked for Chaosium uh, from the late 80s into the early 90s. Uh, so I'm freelancing now. I don't, I'm don't. i not party to 100% of the info that's going on there right now. Uh, but I have been talking to the guys, Nick, uh, Dustin, Triple A, Megan, about where Magic World is. And I understand it's in layout and art direction. Uh, Nick has been showing me the portfolios of some of the guys who've been doing art for it, and uh, I've seen him look really good. I've been working with him to sort of get him an idea of kind of the theme and tone I wish you could the game. We'll see, you know, what happens with that. Uh, so the core rules are set. In fact, uh, I have next to me the uh, my reader's copy. This was printed out on my, uh, my crummy little laser jet, or ink jet, rather, uh, bound to Kinko's. <laughs> Um, and that's pretty much set in stone. I'm, I'm every once in a while looking through it, running a game, and finding a little thing I want to fix and noting it and fixing it. Uh, but that's pretty much done. So are you uh, running are you running a game with Magic World right now? Off and on. You know, I might run a one shot here or there. 
uh, the game I'm running a lot of right now is Open Quest. That's my my core campaign. Uh, when the book actually comes out, I may sorry the Magic World book comes out, I may shift over. To that. Um, I've got some fun ideas I'd like to explore in the longer term thing. Uh, so that's that's the core rules. Um, the advanced sorcery book uh, is pretty much done. Um, uh, I'm sorry, from my perspective, it's uh, it's been sent to Chaosium and they've, they've got it in their hands. Um, so I guess that's the next one on the line. Uh, and then the Chronicler's Guide is the third thing which has been announced so far. And that is essentially a, a GM's pack. Uh, I believe it's going to be bundled with a GM screen, but as we keep adding things to the Chronicler's Guide, it may... The screen, the screen may slip to something else, I don't know. Um, and then we've got a, a few other books in the works. Um, which I don't know if I should I hear there about. might I hear there might be a bestiary. There might be a bestiary. Yeah. <laughs> I know, actually, I, I should, I'll laugh here. Uh, Chris and Jason are both submitting some monsters for the bestiary, and that's coming along really nice. It's the core of that. Oh, the bestiary has been announced. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the core of that is a lot of the old uh, gateway bestiary monsters that never appeared anywhere else. Uh, we're, we're rejiggering those for Magic World, uh, and then I've got some really cool guys. Uh, sending in a lot of, of really neat monsters, uh, so that's going to be a, a really fun book. Yeah, I've been I've been taking a lot of really odd drugs, so I have strange dreams, and I've been taking notes of them uh, for for the creation of monsters. So, this was instructed to do all the weird fantasy monsters. <laughs> Jason is my classic expert, so he's been sending up oh I don't know sirens and scillas and all kinds of strangeness. It, it, this is going to be a fun book. And then uh, a couple more after that. Um, we're exploring the Southern Reaches, which is the, the default campaign setting a little bit more. So um, where, where, do you see, where do you see Magic World uh, as going? I mean, do you see it as... Um, <laughs> it might be kind of egotistical. Do you see it as, like, the next big, you know, sort of center game for uh, Chaosium? I, I never thought it would unseat Call of Cthulhu. Um, I, I would be surprised if, that, if it did. I mean, Call of Cthulhu is it's, it's worldwide. It's, it's, it's a huge game. Uh, it reaches such a broad audience, and it's such an excellent game. Um, Magic World, in many ways, for me, was my tribute to playing Chaosium games for years. Uh, as, as I've said elsewhere, really the core of the game is a cut and paste from Elric. It's a ton of the Ulrich supplements, uh, with all the Moorcock stuff taken out, shuffled together. Uh, the the bestiary is most of the RuneQuest 3rd edition bestiary. Um, the Chronicles Guide is, is primarily the RuneQuest uh, Game Master's book with a bunch of other you know, key NPCs and things. Or, um, I should say key, should, uh, rather I should say uh, sample NPCs. You know, a whole list of 20 or 30 guys you can use to throw in. You need a town guard, here's a fully statted out town guard guy. Um, and for me, it, it was important for a lot of this old Chaosium stuff that really, I think, could have done better uh, to come back and get a second chance. Um, and I started off with a whole different point, and I forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to happen with the three old guys nuttering in a, in a conversation, so... So, uh, so what do you think, uh, Jason? What do you? Uh, how does it uh, feel that? I mean, because you worked for a long time on on getting the the big gold book uh, together, and a um, so long time. Yeah, <laughs> long time. <coughs> um, you know, now that it's it's out, and I mean, it has been out for a while, and there's people that are. <laughs> yeah, I know it's amazing. It's been that long. Um, it's it's been a while. Yeah, I think it was fun because I think it came out right before I moved uh, back to Florida. So I remember, I remember one day getting getting my copy in the mail and it's like, Ooh. I'm, but I, I'm I'm still amazed that it's you know in it's had multiple. Uh, well, I know they did a second printing. It's beautiful to see it in hardcover now. That that's very cool, and the notion that it's it. Uh, spawn so many different licenses and whatnot, and so many other uh, publishers are happy to jump on and use it as the basis for their games. It, it feels awesome. Yeah, that, I'd say that was that was one of the things I was going to ask. Was you know, what it, does it does it feel kind of weird 
now that you see all these other publishers and they're they're doing stuff based off your work and um not well I, I work in the computer game industry where there's an, an uh, astonishing amount of collaboration going on you know constantly I mean nothing is your voice you know it's yeah. always a team of people I mean you, you know everything you do has to be the collaborative work of like you know 50 or 60 people so the notion of uh, you know coming up with a core rule set and seeing other people do wonderful things with it that that doesn't weird me out at all it, it just it feels pretty cool and uh, you know I try to pay attention to all of it and sometimes stuff slips by and I'll be in my local game store and I'll just see something on a shelf and I'll see the BRP logo and go holy cow <laughs> you know when did this, who did this so, of, of the stuff you've seen, what are what are some of your favorites uh, that um, people have done? Well, uh, I still think BRP Rome is just astonishingly um, cool to me. That that's probably my all time favorite thing of all of the different things. I think uh, uh, Sarah uh, Newton's um, uh, Chronicles of Future Earth that mm -hmm. um, was one of the first official. BRP supplements. I think that's very cool. The Coyote Gulch was neat. Um, I see there's some, um, I can't remember the name of it, the Celestial Empire. Um, some of the, the Asian fantasy stuff looks pretty cool. The the stuff that um, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the publisher, but uh, they did a Merry England oh. thing that looked pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I have the PDF of that, and I, I was really, um, I was really impressed with the, like the depth of, of of research and how they managed to, you know, integrate things with the the rules so so tightly. And by uh, by Aleftar, and I think they're distributed by yeah Aleftar. That's it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I think uh, it's I think it was just one of the monographs, but um, Bald de Loop, the uh, sort of the, um, I guess it was a sort of French uh, medieval setting for BRP that also kind of worked for Call of Cthulhu. I thought that was really, really nice. Um, Come out, Nick. What's that? I was. Uh, I admit that Val de Loop uh, very much inspired the campaign setting in Magic World. Cool, like cool. Giving um, you a valley, giving you a small area, and campaign the hell out of it. Yeah. I love and that. Oh, uh, another thing is that I, I actually find myself hoping to see more uh, publishers do other stuff, you know. I mean, I'd love to see somebody do BRP and a, a really cool spy game. I think that it would be a natural fit for a, uh, like a military thriller kind of a, a setting. I think Chaosium has done a, a monograph on it, but I think that the equivalent of Spycraft for yeah. BRP would be pretty neat. Um, I, it would be fun. I'm waiting for somebody uh, um, to do uh, like a really classic space opera style game. For yes. Um, there was that uh, game Worlds Apart, I think, or Worlds Beyond, like a really older game that came hey. out. The, uh, uh, Frank Schumach. What's that? Frank Schumach? Yeah, yeah. And, right. Well, I know that... That Newt over at uh, D101 has been doing a few of those things based on open quests. He's got River of Heaven coming up, which is sort of his love letter to Traveler, uh, and the company which is a military small squad sci-fi kind of I mean, sci-fi uh, modern espionage military black ops sort of deal. Excellent. <laughs> you know, I think <laughs> All right then, and uh, you know somebody should do a zombie game. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I need BRP, B, BRP zombies will never work. No, no, no. <laughs> no. So what about you, Ben? What what uh, kind of stuff for the the what's the, the stuff that's out for the game that uh, that you're really grooving on? You know, pretty much anything I can steal ideas from and use in my own games is aces with me. Uh, Mary England, I've got a copy of it sitting right over here with my my BRP stack. Um, there's, there's so much good stuff in that. The, the campaign setting I'm working on for my own game is very much sort of a Celtic, Saxon, mythic England kind of place, so that, that works there. Uh, what's the new one? Mythic Iceland? Oh, uh, it's a lot of fun. amazing. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Um, my, my son is a Viking nut, and he, he stole the map out of it. He's been looking at it, so I've got to get that back at some point. <laughs> um, 
And yeah, a lot of the fantasy monographs are great. I mean, I've got a stack of the monographs over here. Uh, was it, I think Aces High was their Western, the Weird West thing, you know, with, yeah. with Aces High and Devil's Gulch. Um, I've actually run a few games of that. That was a lot of fun. Westerns are Westerns are a fun. I say Westerns are a fun genre that that don't get a lot of, of play in, yeah. in RPGs or films. One of those weird things where I think people what? like close enough they should know more about it, and I, I don't know. I, I, they get stuck, or they have to they have to fix it with something else. You couldn't just run a straight Western. You got to add. Zombies or steampunk or aliens or something. Well, I think that's that's a a sort of a common knowledge that a lot of people have is that you can't just run a straight whatever. You know, you can't run like a straight historical or you can't run a straight just modern setting. You know, you have to have like magic or zombies or you know something. Otherwise, you know, people just aren't going to like it. And I I, I don't necessarily agree with that conventional wisdom myself, but, you know. Well, then, Jason, I think what your next game is is the BRP Singing Zombie Source Book. Mm. Sweet. I'll buy two. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all set. Yeah, I'll buy one set for the for the rules on singing and one set for the, the, the zombie stuff. It, it, it'll come with one of those uh, those... Like printed plastic uh, forty-five. Uh, the, the old flexi disc, which no one will be able to play because <laughs> they don't. Like, everyone will just go, "What am I supposed to do with this?" I, I own a record player, but then I, I'm a hipster, so I, I'm I'm supposed to. Um, I was, you know, that's funny you, you mentioned that because I was just um, I've been working on on some um, um, blog posts about the the sort of the history of comics. And one of the ones that I was just reading some old, uh, I was reading some of my old Nexus issues, and Steve Barron was talking in the introduction about they did uh, flexi discs. I remember that, that were bound into the into the things, and he was talking about you know just everyone was like, what the hell do I do with this? <laughs> because well, they actually did it. You were supposed to 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 play the flexi disc. While you were reading the comic, it was right. supposed to it was supposed to directly accompany the reading of the comic, and uh, he was talking about how much hassle they went through because they could only get like twenty minutes onto one of these flexi discs. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, just with White Dwarf back in the eighties. Hmm. They did a flexi disc in an issue of uh, White Dwarf magazine back in the late eighties or something. Bolt uh -huh. the forty k single. That's funny. Yeah, I think Alan Moore put one of those in one of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Uh, well, he wanted to, but oh, uh, DC DC wouldn't do it because it, you know, it's it was a flexi not, disc. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a flexi disc, and they like, who the hell's gonna play a flexi disc in this day and age? But yeah, yeah, Alan he wanted to do it in uh, I think it was in Black Dossier was supposed to come That's with right. a flexi disc. I think it it it, it eventually got released, but yeah. Flexi discs, you know, that's that's what gaming needs more of is is bound in flexi discs. Hmm. Screw your... screw this MP3 download crap. They need flexi discs in their games. Cassettes. 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 Um, you know, this... two games that ship with cassettes. <laughs> I read... there was a cyberpunk game that released with a cassette tape. Um, and there was a, a cassette tape soundtrack for for for, for um, Artel Sorian cyberpunk game. Okay, and Dragon Raid. I think the the Christian fantasy RPG. I think they had a cassette tape that taught you. Yeah. How to play the game. And I think they did. I think they did like a a D and D audio cassette where they it was like a sort of a, an audio choose your own adventure. Awesome. There's some series of, of I think it was the Mistara games. Um, mm -hmm. setting back in the early mid nineties, it all came with a CD that you played. I, I have no idea what you're supposed to do with them, but they had them. And I remember we, I used to work at a, a games distributor, and they had them on the shelf, and I would sit there and try to figure out what the point was. And, and you know, it's one of the, like that kind of thing. There it is. You're all set. 
You know, speaking of Jason doing further uh, BRP games, uh, whatever happened to the uh, Planetary Romance game? Uh -oh. uh, it's, it's, it I, I believe I ask you that every time I get you into one of these things. Oh, right. <laughs> it exists. I was just talking with uh, a friend uh, locally. As a matter of fact, I got invited to a, uh, a gaming group, and I was like, oh, what are you running? And he said, I'm doing a Planetary Adventure kind of thing. I was like, oh, man, <laughs> I'm going to have to bow out. I, I'm still working on this, still noodling on it in my spare time. Um, so much stuff has happened. I mean, if I were to lay down the litany of stuff that has happened to me since I began writing that game, it would, you know, just be a, 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 um, a laundry list of doom and despair. You haven't had anything going on. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> I've moved, like, Twice, I've right? The country twice. I've switched jobs like five times. Moved houses about six times. Had a child. All sorts of stuff. Those are just excuses. They are. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I sent a, a link to a friend of the initial announcement for Interplanetary, and I was like, "Oh my god, I can't believe it's been that long." Um, but it is something that I actually, whenever I get little scraps of spare time, I pull out and I work a little more on it. I was just uh, adding a couple of new mutations to the list uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah, I think I even at one point offered to help you publish it if uh, just to get you off your ass and, and doing something about it. <laughs> yeah, believe me, um, I, it's one of these hanging, uh, these things that hangs on me that I want to finish soon. I never would have imagined that a, a John Carter Warlord of Mars film would have gone from not existing to completely being filmed and released and out on video and almost forgotten about in the time since I started that. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> outside of, of uh, BRP, uh, what, what kind of stuff are you guys playing right now? Or not right now, but you know sort of currently, or, you know, what are you looking at, that that sort of thing. Either one of you can answer. I'll start. So, yeah, so I, I could do an open quest. I think I mentioned that, and, and that's still kind of, you know, 90% BRP. Uh, it's a great game. I've been running a lot of the old uh, classic RP stuff with it. Uh, we've been doing a, a, a game in the Big Rubble in Pavis, which has been a hoot. Um, and I actually found over the last you know, year or so that I was working on Magic World, uh, I played a lot of old school games, a lot of the, the clones, Labyrinth Lord, Swords of Wizardry, uh, which for me, uh, obviously it was fun. I was getting together some great guys and slinging dice and, and killing orcs. Um, but it was interesting for me to be able to play those games while working on Magic World and kind of get myself into the, the Steve Perrin mindset. You know, how does Lindblad come out of, of things he was dissatisfied from in D&D? &D? Um, and while I was having a, a great time playing those old games, it was still like, oh, I wonder, you know, the way this is done, I can see now why, or I can remember now, I should say, why, you know, they, they did it this way in, in RQ instead. Um, I've been looking at a lot of uh, little indie games, Don't Rest Your Head, looks really fun. Um, I was goofing around with Fiasco for a while. I, I think Jason and I were kicking ideas back and forth on a, a Romero trilogy-themed uh, playset, a trilogy of playsets for, for Fiasco, which I'm still kind of banging away on. One of them has to be in a mall. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know if I put the mall location in the first one, but it'll definitely come up in the second one. I, the idea is one playset for the original three classic Romero films. You know, I, I, you know, in high school, I took a date to see Day of the Dead because my father's dating advice was take a girl to see a, a scary movie because then she'll want to, like, grab you. And she ended up curled up in a corner of... Uh, uh, up against the wall going, why the hell did you bring me to this movie? And that was, I think, the last time I took dating advice from my father. I actually, uh, when, when my wife and I went on our first date, um, the, the choices of films that night were going to be, uh, I think, Disney's Beauty and the Beast uh, or Wes Craven's People Under the Stairs. And, uh, and I gave her a choice, and she chose Beauty and the Beast. And, um, and you think, stuck with her anyway. And yeah, and I went, you know, <laughs> I, I struggled through it, but she was still talking to me the next day, so that was pretty good. <laughs> what about you, Jason? Um, still running a uh, every other week uh, 
uh, Cthulhu Invictus game, which has still been a lot of fun, just playing old school classic. Um, every now and again, uh, I get together uh, some people who live uh, very close to me, started a Delta Green game that I uh, sat in on. Um, and uh, every so often I play in a fiasco game or do board games. Um, get a lot of gaming actually at my workplace where people, uh, there, there's almost inevitably board games going on during lunch hour at, uh, at work. And so there's a lot of that um, activity. And uh, I, uh, like Ben mentioned, fiasco, I actually uh, put together, I'm, I'm about 90% done with it, but uh, just on a whim, I put together a fiasco playset for a, a Viking themed one. Oh. Probably release into the wild very soon. That's something else the world needs more of Vikings. Yes. Never had. Because that's, that's the new thing. Yeah. Never had too many of them. <coughs> um, so outside of um, of uh, the Magic Quest stuff, uh, is there anything um, else on the horizon for you, Ben? Well, I'm I'm back uh, working pretty hard on something wicked. Which is the uh, the Hero Quest Horror Source book, uh, which is that you and Bruce, right? I'm sorry, you and Bruce. Yes, uh, myself and Bruce Bach. We've been working on that together. Um, he was doing a bunch of the campaign settings. Uh, essentially, at some point towards the back of the book, um, we broke up uh, into three chapters: the uh, oh, was it the Gothic, uh, survival horror, and cosmic horror, and then we we dissect those. You know really take a look at, you know, what everything we built up in the first half of the book, how would you run a gothic, how would you run survival horror, how would you run a, a cosmic horror game, uh, and then he spins that off and he's doing uh, a campaign setting for each. He's actually writing each of those three chapters. Um, um, yeah, I've seen some of the stuff he's been talking about on, on here on Google+. Plus. So. Yeah. yeah, he's doing a new riff on, uh, he, he's been giving me some ideas, or he's been showing me some stuff he's working on for a... Uh, Kind of a Final Fantasy riff on Stalker. Jason, hmm. I bet you just got that that game or something. Um, he's been having a lot of fun with that. So, yeah, so something like that's come along. I had to take a break from it for a few months. Let's get some other stuff done. And I'm back on that. Hero Quest. It's a great game if you've not played it. You know, highly recommend it. It's 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 become my go-to game for you know getting together with the guys. Nobody has any idea what they want to do. Let's just start making stuff up and see what happens. Well, it's really it's really well suited for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think I've only run one scripted adventure so far, uh, and that was the one game I felt the Hero Quest have done that was the most problematic. The ones where we just run it from nothing have been a lot of fun. What about you, Jason? Um, finishing up uh, the, I mean, the last you know few thousand words of uh, the Lords of Gossamer and Shadow. Uh, Amber Diceless role-playing inspired uh, Diceless RPG, and um, then um, you know I'll get back to uh, Interplanetary, finishing that. Sure. I've got, Say that now. Yeah, and then I've got this uh, Viking game that I wrote, uh, like started writing like 15 years ago in Seattle with a friend. I mean, at one point, uh, Chaosium was talking about trying to publish it. Um, we talked to. It was Greg or Dustin way back in the day. Um, and anyway, uh, I'd like to get that thing done and out the door. And so, and then focus on some fiction, maybe. But again, I, I work a pretty busy job in the creative industry and in the MMO space. And so, I'm usually pretty tapped after sitting at a computer writing creative stuff for like 10 hours a day. It's sometimes hard to come home and like immediately blast into. Uh, Want to sit down and do some more game-oriented writing. So yes. unfortunately, stuff takes a bit longer than uh, than I would like, and kind of how projects end up sort of backburnering for quite a while. Well, I can't really cast too many stones. I I'm self-admitted as being one of the world's slowest game developers. <laughs> second second only to you, of course. But you know, well, uh, <laughs> you know, look at the great game. It took 25 years to come out, or something like that. So yeah, isn't slow as time. You know, plenty of time. Uh, well, I guess uh, we can uh, wrap things up. Um, are there any uh, last words or parting comments that you either of you would like to make? 
No comment. No <laughs> <laughs> <Tell> me. <laughs> All right, we'll see. So, okay, so check this out. So this is the first time I've ever done one of these Google things, but I figured out how to do the screen share buttons. I want to show you guys something cool if I can find it again. Uh-oh. Coming up. It better not be porn because YouTube has, has like, standards. No, and I wanted to show you the, uh... Here we go. Check this out. I, I hope this appears. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so that, for, for those in Internet world who care about such things... Um, this is the sketch map I did for the setting for Magic World. Ah. Is that the uh, Southern well, Reaches? The Southern Reaches, yes, exactly. Ooh. So this is the first glimpse of what the setting for the, the game will look like. The game base itself is completely generic. Uh, and then in the last chapter, there's a, a section on, here's a fun little setting to use with it. Um, and essentially, we don't detail anything that's not on the map. Um, so you know, I really just want that's very right. reminiscent of the old, um, the old uh, Tolkien uh, Lord of the Rings maps to me. Well, I, I learned to draw maps back in the old days. I, I drew this years ago. Um, Reminds me a lot of uh, the RQ2 map. I'm sorry? I said it reminds me a lot of the RuneQuest 2 map. I, I copied William Church and I copied the, the Tolkien maps. So uh -huh. looking at the map, I, I managed to learn how to do it. And now I look like well, a map. So. <laughs> well, I guess there are worse things to copy. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, steal from the best, right? Exactly. Well, uh, yes. Oh, I thought you were going to say something else. Um, I just want to thank you both for taking part in this, and um, thank you, Jason, for doing this twice now. Jason, okay. Jason was was. My my first uh, Dorkland roundtable in those ill-fated days when we had to do a normal hangout, and th that was that was just talk talk about a fiasco. That was just fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was just an interest. It was interesting to to watch as the internet just decided every like five minutes to pop in and honk some horns and. <laughs> Sword <laughs> oh yeah, and yeah. You got the worst of it. <laughs> yeah, it, it guys kept popping in to try to hit on on Jess Hartley. <laughs> There's the internet for you. Yeah, but thank you guys for for doing this, and um, um, I guess we will call it a night then. All right, take yeah, care. So good. good to see you both. See you guys. Good night.